yeah um yes uh so uh before the break uh we were looking at what the cross has done for us uh, the new legal status which is ours because of what jesus christ has done on the cross so the finished work of the cross has given us a new legal status and we need to be very very aware uh, that um, um, uh, we are no longer under the law we are under a new master and our new master by his grace he enables us to uh, you know live in a new and holy way we saw that the power of satan over us is broken he no longer has any legal uh, power and authority over us we also saw that we have been redeemed and brought out from that kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light and uh, so uh, the old uh, laws of the previous kingdom no longer have any control over us we have a right to assert ourselves in jesus christ and declare that now we are citizens of a new kingdom and we uh, we can command satan and his minions leave in jesus name they have no choice you know but to vacate uh, our areas um, those areas of our lives that they are trying to dominate uh, so uh, this is uh, this is uh, this is what we have in christ uh, because of the finished work of the cross we'll also very briefly look at uh, you know the the things that are said in scripture about this new identity that we now have because we are in Christ because of our union with Christ what is our uh, new identity uh, our new identity is that we are a blessed people we are we have been blessed with spiritual blessings um, and uh, those spiritual blessings will help us to live a victorious life so we have a scripture which talks about that if someone could read out for us ephesians chapter 1 3 and 4 ephesians 1 3 and 4 Ephesians 1 verses 3 and 4 Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love amen so over here um you know um we have been blessed it says with every spiritual blessing uh and uh, the niv rather than using the word just you know it uses the word for so why have we been given these spiritual blessings because he has chosen us in him you know to be holy and blameless now all these spiritual blessings have been given to us not just to make us rich people in material ways not just to uh, you know uh, uh, see that um, we always you know get healed from sickness those are also vital important parts of our new christian walk but um, these things the spiritual blessings have been given us given us so that we can be holy and blameless so that we, we can live an overcoming life what are some of the spiritual blessings that we have the spiritual blessing of being able to stand over there in complete freedom and make a choice to be able to choose shall i sin or shall i not sin when you were when you were earlier when we were slaves of sin we had no choice we had no say in the matter it was a struggle but now we have we are free we can actually stand over there in complete freedom and choose whether we wish to sin or not it's a spiritual blessing this freedom that we have in christ um, we have the spiritual blessing of um, being able to hear from jesus christ so clearly because he says my sheep will be able to hear my voice so when when the time of temptation comes he will guide us he will tell us how we can escape from that temptation because you know we have the scripture which says that um, when temptation comes he will also show us the way of escape so uh, we have the spiritual blessing of being able to hear from him so in in our time of crisis he will tell us what to do uh, what to say and he will show us the way of escape so that we can you know overcome that particular temptation we have the spiritual blessing of using his um, word the word of god as a sword uh, and that can be a very powerful weapon so uh, we have all of these spiritual blessings that have been given to us uh, why were they given to us because god god has chosen us in jesus christ 
to be holy and blameless. So uh, we are blessed. We are spiritually rich in blessings, which uh, which enable us, equip us to live a overcoming life. In the same way, we also have been enriched. Uh, let's look at a passage which talks about that. Um, if someone could read out for us, 1 Corinthians 1, 4 to 9. 1 Corinthians 1, 4 to 9. First Corinthians chapter 1, verses 4 to 9. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given to you by Jesus Christ, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm, confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Okay, so, yes. So if we look in verse uh, 5, you know, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 5, um, the actual words used over there, the Greek words used over there are words that we are actually familiar with. For in him, you have been enriched in every, in, in every way. How have we been enriched? With all kinds of logos and with all gnosis, that is G-N-O-S-I-S. So these are two things, you know, these, these are two words that we are kind of familiar with already. It says, we have been enriched with all kinds of logos and with all gnosis. Um, now the word logos, you know, uh, we know uh, it, 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 it is applied to words. It is applied to speech. Uh, it also talks about the word of God. So we have been given all kinds of uh, logos, uh, all kinds of words, all kinds of speech. And in the, in the, in the translation that you know, Ros Rosalind read out, uh, it says utterances. So here, it is talking about uh, the spiritual gifts of, uh, you know, um, word of prophecy, word of knowledge, and word of wisdom. It's talking about that. It is also talking about the written word of God, which is also another form of speech, another form of utterance. So we have been given all kinds of utterances, all kinds of words or speech. We have been, we have been given all kinds of logos and something else. We have also uh, been given uh, gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, that is basically your knowledge. So um, he he also gives us the ability to know how to you know handle each situation. So we have uh, the spiritual gifts, we have the written word of God, uh, we have um, uh, the divine knowledge which is given to us on how to tackle each situation you know that we face. So uh, it, it goes on to say in verse 7, therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift. Okay, so everything that you require to live a victorious life, it has been given to you. So we don't lack in any way. And that is why it says in verse 8, he will also keep you firm to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So uh, God will use these um, you know, if if we choose to use these giftings that we have, uh, if we choose to use this logos that we have, you know, if we choose to use these things, then uh, through them, God will keep us firm to the end. If we choose that we don't want to use them, you know, and uh, um, then of course we will not be able to walk in victory. But if we are making use of all the uh, you know, giftings and logos which is given to us. If we make use of the knowledge which God imparts to us when we cry out to him and say, you know, Lord, help me, show me how to overcome this stronghold, how to overcome this area of weakness in my life. When we when we reach out to him and ask him for, for actively for these things, it says he will keep us firm to the end. Why? Because it says in verse 9, God is faithful who has called you into fellowship with his son. So the Lord will be faithful. He will enable us to live victoriously. This is something that we can have 
you know in him because uh, he is very very faithful to his word he will enable us um, and uh, uh, th that is why in second corinthians 3 5 you know it, it says something very nice over there if someone could read out second corinthians 3 verse 5 Second Corinthians chapter three verse five, not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. All right. So um, if you look at the immediate context of this particular verse, um, it's actually talking about you know uh, apostleship. It's talking about how you know Paul and his uh, leaders have been. Um, enabled by god to be good leaders so they're saying you know we're not, we're not saying that we are good leaders on our own god has enabled us so that is why we have what we have so that is of course the immediate context of the verse but then if you, if you were to take that verse more broadly all the sufficiency all the competence that's the word that niv uses we are we are the competence that we have to be able to handle things is because god has given that to us so you know in uh, in that sense niv says not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves but our competence comes from god he is he has given us all competency so this is something that we need to remember we have been made competent to overcome every single kind of temptation so we don't have to say i lack competency in this particular area no no yeah, all competency comes from God. And when we reach out to him and we ask him, he is faithful. He will grant us what we require to overcome, you know, even those areas of sin and temptation. Um, another thing that we can uh, we need to remember regarding our identity in Christ is that we are uh, victorious. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 2, 14. If someone could read out. Second Corinthians chapter two verse fourteen. Now, thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ, and through us diffuses the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. Yeah, uh, you know, um, NIV brings out the meaning of that. You know, what is what, what does it mean? He's leading us in you know in in His procession. Uh, uh, so it kind of it kind of tries to make the meaning of that of that uh, sentence clear by putting it in this way this is what niv says but thanks be to god who always leads us as captives in christ's triumphal procession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere because you see in those times in those ancient times when you would have a procession being held by a king that's actually a uh, procession of victory where the king is you know walking ahead he's come back from a battle and now he's you know uh, walking in in a royal procession towards his um, palace okay so he walks through the city to show off what he has achieved in that battle so behind him are all these captives whom he has captured you know the the the, the the powerful king of the other nation whom he has defeated that man is being dragged along you know in a, uh, with with all shackles and chains around his uh, hands and feet and uh, all his nobles and commanders and officers they're all you know now in chains and this royal king was walking in the front he's saying see i have won the victory these guys they are my captives this is how powerful i am so it's that kind of a procession and uh, so uh, it says thanks be to god who always leads us as captives in christ's triumphal position and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere so originally when paul used this imagery it would have sounded a little funny to his listeners because you know we generally think of captives as uh, pathetic being someone to be pitied but over here you know because generally speaking in a triumphal procession the uh, the people who are getting led i have nothing to be happy about they are now captives they are now slaves not a very nice place to be uh, because you know especially if you look um, you know in in our old testament times you know second chronicles chapter 33 verse 11 where manasseh gets led away 
you know, as a prisoner, I mean, the condition that he is in, they actually put a hook, a metal hook in his nose. Like, you know, the, the, the way they do with cattle, with oxen, you know, um, uh, 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 it, it's like as if, um, you know, uh, they're saying you are no better than an animal. So um, uh, in, in Second Chronicles chapter 33, verse 11, we see that he's, a hook is put uh, through his nose and he is bound in shackles of bronze. And in that condition, he is you know, taken away. So um, basically, in the in the in the in the you know in the natural sense, being a captive is something very horrible, uh, very terrible. But here, in Christ's triumphal procession, we are captives who were in a very very pathetic condition. We were like this Manasseh, but now we are captives who have been set free by our new master jesus christ so yes we are still now slaves we are slaves of our new master but our new master why did he set us free not to throw us in some dungeon and make our lives miserable but so that he could restore our lives so that he could rebuild us so it's a it's a whole different kind of a procession it's like a king who has gone into battle and you know um uh, conquered all these people and they all were in slave, uh, in slavery and misery. Now he's bringing them out. He has set them free. So yes, now he is their new master. But he's not brought them out to make them miserable. He's brought them out to build their lives. And so that is why in this procession, when these captives are being led in victory, they don't. Uh, they, they're not following Christ as defeated people who are now helpless, you know, what to do now, they, they are under this new king. No, they are in fact walking with great joy, like royalty. And they're saying, look, you know, we were in, the, in that horrible kingdom of darkness, but now Christ has led us out and we are walking in this triumphal procession as conquerors, as people who have been set free. Uh, so uh, that is why when this procession is going along, you don't smell defeat. You don't smell shame and humiliation. Rather, it says over here, you know, this, uh, the, uh, the aroma of the knowledge of him is spread everywhere. So we go around, you know, we go to our neighbors, we go to the, our office place, um, we, we, you know, we go to our social circles. We go over there as Christ's captive, uh, but uh, we are not shamed and defeated or humiliated. We say, once upon a time, we were slaves of sin, but now we are slaves of our new master, Christ. And what is he doing? He's causing us to walk in victory. He's causing, we, we, he's ca he's causing us to walk in spiritual blessings. We have been enriched with all kinds of utterances and knowledge. And so we, we in fact, use our giftings among the people to help them, to be a blessing to them. So we are... Uh, spreading the aroma of being a slave of Christ. Being a slave of Christ has a very pleasant aroma. It smells very good. It's not the smell of defeat. It's not the smell of, uh, you know, of humiliation or shame. It's a very different aroma. So we need to remember that we are not following Christ as defeated, helpless people, but rather we are following him as victors as victorious people who are now who now can live in a new and different way and as we pass by everyone smells this new life that we have and they think wow so this is what it is like to be living under jesus christ this is the kind of life that he gives his slaves you know so is is is, is what they learn about us so uh, we have to uh, understand that our identity is one of victory, or of uh, of of, a, of of being of our heads being lifted up, you know, rather than being defeated uh, and being shamed. Uh, if we can also look at Romans chapter five, verse seventeen, if someone could read out for us, Romans five seventeen. Romans chapter five, verse seventeen. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. 
here it says that now that we are under jesus christ you know earlier of course we were under death and we were in a terrible condition but no, but now we are under jesus christ and this is what we have received it says who receive uh, god's abundant provision of grace okay so an abundant provision of grace has been given to us why to reign in life we are meant to be rulers ruling in life we are no longer defeated we are no longer helpless so our identity is that in our hands we are holding an abundance of provision of grace for every situation for every circumstance for every area of weakness an abundant provision of grace has been given so that that area of weakness no longer needs to be an area of weakness it can become an area of strength why because we are holding in our hands an abundant provision of grace okay so these are all things the realities that we need to understand and we start need to start teaching our minds these things because our mind is not aware of these things automatically it's something that we would have to teach our mind uh, and we renew our mind by telling it these things and slowly the mind begins to see itself as being a victorious person you start your perspective starts changing you start seeing yourself the way christ sees you and that makes a huge difference um you know so um um yeah i mean i yeah i have an example in mind but then i think maybe we could talk about that uh, in another class um just moving on to uh, hebrews 4:15 uh yeah if someone could read out for us hebrews 4:15 Hebrews chapter 4 verses verse 15 for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin yeah uh, so um, our new representative jesus christ you know who's very different from adam our old representative so this new representative of ours jesus christ he lived he he it says over here um um who was tempted in every way so all the temptations that we face he too has faced all of those temptations but of course he was without sin so he knows the strategy he knows how every kind of temptation can be overcome this is something that he knows and so he can reveal that to us when we go to him you know then 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 in the next uh, verse in fact that's what it says it says because he is that kind of a high priest you know go to his throne with confidence to receive grace and mercy in your time of need is what it says in the next verse so this is a high priest who has gained victory over every kind of temptation and he knows the strategy how you can overcome all types of temptation so when we go to him and we uh, we learn to you know uh, to live under him abide in him to hear from him every day because uh, as we as we spend time with him we, we we begin to hear his voice more clearly we become more comfortable in hearing from him you know we won't be as spiritually deaf as we used to be in our early days as a believer now we can hear him better because he gives instructions he gives important instructions on a moment by moment basis so uh, so he is able to equip us he is able to guide us on and show us how to live in victory uh, because you know he has um, he has already been through the process and so he knows how uh, what methods we can use you know in our own situations uh, to live in victory and that is why in psalm 1834 you know um, this is what it says if someone could read out uh, psalm 1834 Psalms eighteen thirty four. He teaches my hands to make war, so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. Okay, a bronze bow. You know, a bow made of bronze is not an easy thing to bend. See, if your if your um, uh, bow is made of wood, 
you know, and and you kind of you know you you pull back on the string, and uh, you know this uh, this bronze uh, bow which is there, you know the the frame of that, uh, you know that that has to get stretched that way, and then this uh, string gets stretched this way. Uh, so you would need to have a certain amount of strength uh, to be able to handle a wooden bow. But when it comes to a uh, you know a bow of bronze, how much greater would you know would your strength need to be? Uh, you know, so um, it says, um, my uh, he trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You know, so um, you 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 gain victory over your enemy. You take their bow, and you know you're able to bend it. You know, you're able to you know uh, uh, to, to, to to maybe even break it. So it's talking about victory over here. So sometimes when I'm facing you know situations which i'm finding very difficult to handle i say lord this is what you promised in your word you said you would train my hands for battle you said that i would be strong enough you know to take satan's bow and break it in two you know so this is the kind this is what you have promised uh, me uh, so lord you help me now in my situation so you know th this is these are you know promises that we can claim for ourselves something very similar even in psalm 144 verse 1 if someone could read out Psalm 144, verse 1. Psalm, Psalm 144, verse 1. Praise be to the Lord, my rock, who trains my hand for war, my fingers for battle. Okay, so almost the same thing is mentioned in uh, Psalm 18 and Psalm, 1, Psalm 144. God is the one who trains our hands for war. He is the one who trains our fingers for battle. Of course, it's using Old Testament imagery over here of the bow and arrow and all of that. But today, when we are facing our trials and temptations, when we need to overcome and live victoriously, he is the one who trains us. So we can go to him and say, Lord, this is what you promised. You said that you will train my fingers for battle. Now, Lord, you show me how to overcome this thing where I, you know, this area of my life where I keep failing again and again. How, Lord, can I be victorious? And the Lord, you know, the Holy Spirit, he will uh, teach us. He will train us. He will show us how to live in victory. So uh, this is a personalized training that goes on. You know, from the pulpit, uh, when, when the preacher preaches, he gives us certain guidelines on how to, you know, live uh, live a victorious life. You know, they, uh, for instance, you know, the preacher would say, you know, you must learn to re read the word of God daily and meditate upon it. Uh, you must avoid bad company because bad company would suck you back into those old ways. So some general principles are given to us from the pulpit on how to live an overcoming life. But God, who is with you, indwelling you on a daily basis, he is able to take those general principles and apply them to you to your personal life in a very customized manner so you so that is why it is so vital to remain and abide in the wine because then the wine teaches you you know jesus christ teaches you through his holy spirit how to be victorious in individual situations uh, so uh, uh, this is not something that you can do if you are if your connection with the wine is weak. So it is very important for us to build our connection with Him, to be strong in Him. Um, you know, uh, the stronger the connection, the more we are able to hear, the more our hands get trained for war, and the more victories we will uh, we will enjoy, and you know we will be able to break uh, what uh, bows made of bronze. We'll be able to break them into two. You know, so we will have that kind of uh, uh, power and authority, which is why it says in Ephesians, um, yeah, right, yeah. Okay, if, if you can read out Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, someone could read out Ephesians 2, 6. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. And and he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, so we are mm -hmm. familiar with this, right? Uh, so we're in the spiritual realm, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. 
you know, which is very, very nice. Uh, but what should you be doing? Because you're seated over there in the heavenly realm, what should be your attitude? If that gets explained to us in Colossians 3, 1 to 3. Colossians 3, 1 to 3. Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 to 3. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. So it's all very well to say, yes, I'm now seated in the heavenly realm with Christ. But then in your thinking, you still have the unrenewed thinking. You're still chasing after the things of the world. You're still, you know, longing and desiring for uh, sinful things. Then it's pointless. It really doesn't matter where you're sitting because in your mind, you are still very much here on this earth. So it's not enough that you are, uh, that your spirit is seated with Christ in the heavenly realm. Maybe you should also take your mind over there you know, to, and ask it to join the spirit. So in our thinking, we need to start uh, desiring the things of God. We need to set our affections on divine, eternal things rather than these temporary things you know, after which the world runs. Uh, so uh, rather than focusing on just temporal pleasures, we choose to set our, uh, our desires and our hopes and our ambitions on eternal things. So if this basic fundamental change doesn't happen in our thinking, it's going to be very, very difficult to live a victorious life because your unrenewed mind and your flesh will continue to crave and long for the, for the things which the world you know, longs for. And uh, so even though your spirit is seated in the heavenly realm with Christ, it will be of no use. You've got to start taking your mind also to that level and say, you know, tell your mind, you know, you are now a new creation. And this is what the Bible says about you. Begin to start understanding this and begin to start living it. So you who are seated, you know, in your spirit, in the spiritual realm with Jesus Christ, need to drag your mind off from this earthly level and tell it kindly start aligning yourself with scripture, with what scripture says about you. Then it will become easier for you to, you know, live a victorious life. And that is why look, look at the kind of wording that is used in Romans 16, 19 and 20. Romans 16, 19 and 20, please. Romans chapter 16, verse 19 and 20. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I'm full of joy over you. But I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. The God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. The grace of our Lord Jesus be with you. All right. So here, there's something very practical that uh, you know uh, Paul is saying to the Roman believers. He's saying, be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. So you know you're now sitting in this in the seated in this in the heavenly realm. Start focusing on the things of the heavenly realm. Start focusing on the things of God. You know, um, uh, become wise in those things. Get more and more knowledgeable, and you know, get more and more wisdom regarding those things. So don't keep chasing after the earthly things. Rather, when it comes to the earthly things, be innocent about them. Where you're, you know, ignorant. Where you don't, where you almost don't even know about those things, you know, because um, there are people, you know, who who are living um, with the Lord in such a wonderful way. Um, you talk to them about certain sinful things; they don't, they, they they didn't even realize that such things existed on the earth. They're like, "Oh my goodness, such things are also going on, is it?" Is what they say. They're so innocent about what is evil, and they have been growing in their wisdom regarding the godly things of the heavenly realm. And that is the way we should be, you know, rather than setting our affections on the things of the world and being so knowledgeable about all the sinful things of the world. Rather, we should be people who have become uh, more and more, um, you know, uh, heavenly minded in the sense that now our our interest lies over there. Our ambitions are, you know, in, in, in reaching those uh, heights. And, you know, um, uh, all of our... Uh, thinking our hobbies our desires everything is now you know heaven oriented so we are very very wise in those things 
and we are like almost innocent about evil things we don't even know about these sinful things uh, you know uh, let alone indulge in them so that is the kind of attitude that we should begin to develop because when we do that verse 20 very important the god of peace will soon crush satan under your feet because you see you are someone who has been focusing on the lord you have set your affections on the heavenly realm you are getting wiser and wiser about things which are good when it comes to evil you are innocent you almost know nothing about these things about these things which the world does and the world is running after you are so um, you know uh, innocent in those areas that god will personally crush satan under your feet i mean you don't you know you just have to walk in him he will you know because we we already, we already uh, saw that right satan has no power over us so satan uh, so 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 god will have satan crushed under our feet you know he will give us the strategy on how to you know overcome uh, uh, sin uh, we we you know we, we looked at all of that in the previous verses uh, so even as we are using our uh, you know spiritual giftings even as we are depending on him even as we are abiding in him he will show us what to do so he will see to it that satan gets crushed under our feet because we are wise in the things of god and we have chosen to stay innocent regarding evil things so we are in a position of power on the other hand if we are very knowledgeable about the world and the and the evil in it and all the different kinds of sins and you know that is our speciality that's our specialization then we are in a position of weakness because we know we know very little about the heavenly things we know so less about uh, you know the things of god so our hearts have not got excited about the things of god because we don't even know about those things how are we going to get excited, excited about them and when we are in living in that way it is so easy to get swayed by satan forget about satan getting crushed under our feet he will crush us you see so it is so important for us to be in a in a position of strength that is we choose to be very wise about the things of god and when it comes to the things of the world we have such little contact with the, with the world that we are in fact not even aware of certain of those you know of the things which are going on um, you know as far as the evil deeds and the evil sin sinful actions of the world is concerned we stay innocent regarding such things i am not saying that we should be ignorant about current affairs uh, we need to be very aware of what's going on in the world because only then we can pray and intercede you know and we can we can um, use the word of god against the things which the, which the satan is doing in the world and break those things so uh, yes we should be very aware of current affairs and what's going on in the world around us but when it comes to sinful deeds sinful actions the things that people in uh, of the world indulge in we should maybe stay very innocent about such things and not even be aware of them you know so uh, that is the uh, a good place of strength to be in because then you know this is what happens for us uh, john 14:30 where jesus is talking about himself what does he say john 14:30 John chapter fourteen verse thirty. I will not speak with you much longer, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold on me. So, um, the prince of this world, Satan, had no hold over Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was wise in the things of God. He was innocent when it came to evil, and because he was in that position of strength. and he never gave in to temptation and sin he the the evil one had no hold over him so when we start living like christ you know we we are not only seated in the heavenly realm in our spirit but even we are renewing our mind and causing our mind to dwell on spiritual things when we are in that position of strength satan starts losing his hold over us he can't control us you know like he used to earlier and then you know he will find himself getting crushed under our feet on a daily basis because god will do that for us he will enable us he will help us so um, these are things that we you know uh, need to remember regarding our identity in uh, christ now moving into this uh, next section 
you know, using the word of God. Uh, we all are very familiar with this. We know that we are supposed to use the word of God, um, you know, as our sword, as a spiritual sword uh, to fight Satan. And we also always refer to, you know, Jesus Christ, how Jesus Christ, when he was tempted, he overcame um, temptation uh, with the word of God. Um, but, you know, just to kind of dwell upon aspects of this, which we generally don't seem to be uh, talking about. Uh, so we will try to you know uh, focus more on those areas which are kind of neglected regarding this usage of God's word. Um, so let's get started off. Um, you know, we don't have much time. So, you know, let's kind of rush a little bit. First John chapter 2, verse 14, if someone could read out. First John 2, 14. First John chapter 2, verse 14. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Okay, so here it's uh, talking about uh, spiritual maturity. Okay, so when it says fathers, it's not talking about people who are uh, older in age. It's just talking about people who have uh, been in God uh, so long that now they have reached a level of spiritual maturity where they are mentoring other people. You know, they are being spiritual fathers towards other people. So um, it's talking about those who have um, kind of arrived in spiritual life. You know, they've, they've reached a very high level of maturity. Um, uh, but the beautiful thing is what he says about these youngsters, the ones who are still growing in the Lord, you know, and uh, it, he says something so, I mean, the highest compliment that you could possibly give uh, a person who's still you know, growing in God. He says, I have written to you, young men, because you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the wicked one. Wow, what a bunch of people they must have been. You know, the word of God is abiding in them. And because the word of God is abiding in them, they are strong and they are able to overcome the wicked one. You know, these are the kind of, um, you know, believers that we should be, you know, imitating, uh, that we should be emulating. Uh, so um, what does it mean over here when it says that the word of God is abiding in them? It's like the word of God has taken permanent residence in them. You know, these are people who are really renewing their minds on a daily basis. The scripture is like it's there in their hearts. It's there in their system. You know, so um, whenever there's a there's a, there's a situation that needs to be handled, it's the word of God which comes to their minds first. They approach the situation in a in a in a in a biblical manner, in in a word manner. You know, in in accordance with the word of God. So because these people are are, are literally having the word of God abiding in them, you know, dwelling in them on a permanent basis, these people are strong uh, and they are able to overcome the uh, evil one. So um, there are three you know, simple things that we too can do so that the word of God abides in us in this powerful manner. The first one, obviously, is that we would have to feed ourselves with the word of God. And, uh, you know, um, this is something that's taken for granted. And so we, are all, we all know that, you know, we need to spend time in God's presence, reading his word. And um, even as we are feeding our inner man with the word of God, our inner man become, becomes you know, stronger. Uh, this is something that we are aware of. Uh, but, you know, let's look at uh, this in slightly greater detail. Um, if someone could read out First Peter chapter 2, Verses 2 and 3. First Peter 2, 2 and 3. First, First Peter chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Mm, something verses about 2 and 3. Mm. Yeah. As newborn babies desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. You know, so it says like newborn babies crave the pure spiritual milk. Uh, that's the wording that is used in our uh, NIV. Uh, so, you know, we look at this in slightly greater detail. I think all the things that I wanted to say for this particular chapter are not going to happen this class. So, okay, yeah, no props. We'll, you know, we'll just continue next class. Uh, but at least, you know, this first one, one, one bit, Let's kind of grasp that in the little time that we have left. 
it's talking about um, newborn babies, the way they crave, the way they desire the spiritual milk, the way they, the way they desire physical milk, you know, we should also be craving for spiritual milk. A newborn baby, when it first comes out of the womb, it doesn't know anything about milk. Because you see, when it was inside the womb, it was not having milk, right? So uh, a newborn baby, when it first comes out, it's not even aware of the such a thing as, as milk. But then gradually, as the days go by, it kind of begins to realize that there's a direct connection between milk and that uncomfortable feeling inside going away. You know, so um, whenever that feeling of, of that hunger comes, it realizes, oh, if I you know open my mouth and cry loudly, then they'll give me milk. And when they give me milk, that you know, that that empty feeling inside goes away and I feel satisfied. The baby begins to understand this slowly. Once the baby gets the hang of this idea, you know what happens, right? <laughs> day in, day out, the kid screams at the top of its lungs. And you see, this is not just a desiring the milk. It's literally that that's the, that's the actual word used over there in, in your Greek. Um, it's that word epipotheo, which means a deep craving. So a baby, the way it craves for the milk, the way it screams for the milk, you know, when it when it wants the milk. That is the way we are supposed to crave the spiritual milk, the word of God. Why? Why do we? Why do we crave in that way? Because we have tasted that the Lord is good. This baby, which knew nothing about milk, kind of got the hang of it. He thought, "Ah, this is good stuff. Whenever I have this stuff, that I I, I feel satisfied." And so now that the baby has understood that milk is a nice thing, it it craves it, and when it doesn't get it, it just screams. And we are supposed to be like that. We Once we get a taste of the Lord and uh, how his word feels, what his word can do for us, you know, how it draws us closer to him, into his presence. Once we have tasted that, we will begin to crave it. We will long for it. And that is something that we would have to consciously, you know, uh, cultivate in us. There are some very, very important practical things that I wanted to say regarding this matter. But then with two minutes, let's not even go there. You know, we'll talk about that um, uh, next class. But, you know, there are some things that we are neglecting to do regarding this whole thing about feeding our inner person, you know, with the word of God. Um, and I see this a lot of people doing that, and it kind of you know affects their being able to live a victorious life. So we will talk about that uh, next class, you know. So please do log in next class. For today, we will just end with this: that at least we should be having a craving, uh, the deep craving for the Word of God, and that craving starts once we taste and see that the Lord is good. If that has not happened for us. We will not even feel any craving, first of all, you know. So, um, yeah. So we kind of will just end on that incomplete note. Uh, but we will, of course, resume next class once again. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Let's just close with a word of prayer. We thank you, O Lord, for all the things that we could see from your word today. Um, we, we, we pray, O Lord, that uh, uh, we will always remember the finished work of the cross. Just like those believers in Revelation who were able to overcome the evil one by the blood of Christ and the word of their testimony, we pray that we too will be people who will always remember the blood of Christ, the finished work of the cross, and how that has placed us uh, in, a, in, a, in a place of victory, how we now have a new legal status in you. We pray that we will always remember that. And we pray, O oh Lord, that we would declare that as our testimony. And by declaring it, we, we pray that we will overcome Satan and we will overcome temptation. And that, Lord, we will be able to live in a way which honors you. You enable us, O oh Lord. You, O oh Lord, turn these lessons and this uh, theory into practice on a day-to-day -day basis for us so that we can really be people who are honoring you. You do that for us, O oh Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you so much. And um, uh, yes, uh, we'll meet again next week. Thank you, Pastor. Thank, Thank you, you. ma'am, so much. Thank you.